everyone, welcome to our uh, webinar today on all electric yard care, ditch the gas. My name is Joe Warchunas, I'm with Electrify Now. I'm here with my teammate, Brian Stewart. Uh, we'll be introducing our fantastic panelists shortly. Thank you all so much for joining uh, us today. We're really excited about this webinar. Great, so uh, as those of you who have joined us for Electrify Now webinars before uh, know, um, we are Electrify Now. We uh, promote electrification and we try to boil it down to four clear and easy steps. Uh, number one, clean up your electric supply, whether that means buying clean energy from your utility, uh, signing up for community solar or buying your own solar panels. All those are great ways to make sure your electric supply is 100% uh, carbon neutral. Um, electrify your home. Many of us are on the journeys to switch out all of our fossil fuel, aka natural gas appliances, and replace them with clean and efficient electric appliances, uh, or in this case, lawn uh, equipment. Um, electrify your ride is the third step. So that means uh, get rid of that gas guzzler and go for a clean electric vehicle. And then uh, step four is electrify everyone. So let's talk a little bit about um, electrify everyone. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, before we get to that, we'll be right there in one second. We wanna say a big shout out to our Electrify Coalition members. This is a group of almost 40 organizations that's formed in the last nine months that, that believes and promotes electrification. Uh, three recent members are Menlo Spark, uh, SoCan and Green Change. So thank you to all of our members. If you'd like to become a member of the Electrify Coalition, there's no cost or fee or anything, uh, just join us in this work. Uh, you can email Brian or I, we'll be including our emails. Um, so the Electrify Everyone program, uh, you may have seen it when you signed up or heard us talk about it before, but we are just so thrilled with this program. We're partnering with a nonprofit called Community Energy Project to replace old gas water heaters in uh, low-income households with clean, efficient uh, heat pump water heaters that are free to people. And we're raising money uh, to do that through our webinars. So far, thank you to all of our uh, uh, listeners and donors. We've raised over $3,000 just through our webinars and much more through, through other sorts of, of donors. Um, we've installed uh, 40 uh, heat pump water heaters to date and we have plans to do 65 this year. Uh, your donations make a huge difference. I'll put a link in the chat. Thank you so much to all of you for donating. Quick plug for our upcoming webinars. Uh, you know, we do a uh, usually a webinar a month, sometimes more. In July, we're gonna be talking about ductless heat pumps uh, with the heat pump store. You don't wanna miss this one, uh, the uh, most efficient heating solution. In August, we'll be talking about batteries and, genera uh, batteries and generators, excuse me. Uh, a lot of us have seen uh, some issues with the Texas grid. We wanna tackle this issue head on on how we can go all electric and still be resilient. And then as part of uh, hang dry week, where we're talking about clean, efficient ways to do uh, our laundry, we'll be looking into heat pump dryers, front load washers, and of course, hang dry. So with that, I'll kick it over to uh, my partner here, Brian. Thanks, Joe. So um, we got a lot to talk about today. Um, just gonna give you a little preview about some of the things we're gonna be covering. So you know what we're gonna, if this is interesting to you, we're gonna start with just a little bit of level setting about you know, the reality with gas powered tools today in terms of pollution and toxic waste, et cetera, and, and how the battery um, platforms are starting to uh, rival gas in terms of performance and productivity and wh what the electric uh, advantages are, and then tips for how to make the change. Maybe if you're a homeowner doing the, the work yourself or uh, what, and what's going on with the commercial landscaping industry in terms of this transition. And uh, specifically how cities and schools and communities can electrify their fleets and this cool idea of the green zone that uh, Dan Mabe is going to be talking about, certified green zones. And then our uh, partners on the manufacturing side are going to be telling us about trends and developments in the, in the equipment that's available today and, and what we're going to be seeing in the future. So a lot to talk about. If that's interesting to you, stick around. Uh, I want to start really high level though, um, like we usually do with why are we talking about this topic in the first place? Why is it important to be thinking about electrifying our, the landscape maintenance industry? And you know, usually we talk to you about carbon emissions and while your, your lawnmower isn't near as big of a source of carbon emissions as your automobile is, it's still pretty significant when you add up all the gasoline that's used across the country to mow lawns. And, this is data from the Department of Energy from 2014, so it's probably a little bit 
low, but uh, and it's only for mowing, not for other forms like you know gas leaf blowers and trimmers, etc. But still, it's a significant amount of uh, gasoline that's consumed for maintaining our our lawns, and that adds up to about 68 million tons of CO2 every year just for keeping our lawns looking good. I know it's a little hard to wrap your head around 68 million tons. So I, I, I like to try to kind of bring this back to human scale a little bit. So bear with me here. But if you and I were walking down the street and we saw a pile of plastic waste in the middle of the road, like 100 plastic bottles and 100 plastic bags and 100 forks and spoons and plastic knives, 100 of those plastic takeout containers that we're familiar with, 100 of those plastic cups we got our yogurt in and 1,000 plastic straws mixed into that pile, we'd be horrified. Um, and we'd be thinking about you know, climate change when we looked at that. But I think you'd be really horrified to know that, that the carbon emissions from that horrible pile of plastics waste is less than the carbon emissions from burning one gallon of gasoline. So if plastics makes it easier for you to get your brain around carbon emissions, which we can't see, if it helps you to visualize it, I, I hope so. And obviously when we you know, take care of our lawns, it doesn't take a whole gallon of gas to do that. But even just weekly maintenance for a typical home in the United States, mowing, blowing, and trimming, you're, you're kind of emitting equivalent to a wheelbarrow full of plastic trash. So imagine you have your nice, beautiful lawn after it's all taken care of, and then you sprinkle a wheelbarrow full of plastic trash around that. If that helps you visualize the impact, uh, I, I hope it sticks with you. There are other reasons to be concerned about these things, though, that are not about carbon, it's more about air pollution. And we like to compare them to cars because these devices typically don't have the same pollution controls that cars have. They've, they're better than they used to be, but they're still, in some cases, hundreds of times more polluting than cars, depending on the pollutant you're looking at. But in general, you could say that just taking care of your yard every week is pretty much equivalent to having a car revving its engine in your driveway for 10 hours, which most people would not feel good about. And when you talk about the actual pollutants, they're nothing to sneeze at. We you know, kind of associate that smell of burning gasoline with summer. <laughs> Some people think it's a, it's a smell of summertime coming, but these pollutants are nothing to, be, uh, to take lightly. And you know, a lot of organizations, including the EPA, recognize that these pollutants um, increase risk of cancer, respiratory disease, cardiovascular, neurological diseases. So they're not insignificant. It's not just an unpleasant smell. All those are reasons why we should be interested and excited about uh, electrification of the industry. And this is why I'm really excited to introduce three fantastic guests we have today. Couldn't ask for a better list of experts on this topic. We're gonna to start with Dan Mabe. He's the founder of American Green Zone Alliance, AGSA, a good friend of mine, possibly the single individual in the country who knows more about this topic than anyone. Uh, we're gonna start with him. Dan grew up in the mow and blow business and as a teenager was out there working with uh, high volume landscape maintenance, gas tools. He started his own all electric company 20 years ago when the tools that we're gonna talk about today did not exist. He was really cobbling together some Frankenstein, he called it his Franken equipment. And then as the tools got better, he started to shift his focus to helping to scale those solutions to bigger uh, applications like city, schools, parks, and other organizations to help them transition their fleet. So we're gonna start with him. And I'm also excited to have um, Jason Jones here from Ego. He's a business development manager for Ego North America and helping to build this brand literally from nothing. If you have been paying attention, this brand didn't even exist a few years ago. And now they're one of the leaders in this battery platform space for outdoor power equipment. Super excited to have Jason with us. And then we've got Jack Easterly from Husvarna. Husvarna is a super well regarded uh, company that's been working in the commercial landscape industry for years and years and has really made a commitment to um, all electric products. And uh, Jack's the brand manager for the handheld professional products. And he'll be telling us about that. Both these guys will be giving us a little glimpse of what's happening in, in that industry. So thank you uh, panelists for joining us. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dan here and Dan, take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Brian. And, and just some quick housekeeping. Uh, just really want to thank you, Brian Stewart, and the team at Electrify Now uh, for coordinating this and all the work you do uh, for this initiative. It's, it's been really rewarding to, to collaborate with you guys. 
And then, of course, um, Jason Jones of Ego and Jack Easterly of Who's Varna. Um, as you will see in some of my slides, we're definitely utilizing uh, their technology with a, uh, electric platforms to meet our end and, and help uh, really uh, clean up the industry and, and bring better health to the workers. And then, of course, all of the participants today. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and screen share, Brian. Okay, so this is what it's going to sound like, hopefully, in your community when you're able to transition uh, away from some of the uh, industrial gas equipment uh, that is being used in our communities uh, every day. Um, American Green Zone Alliance, who are we? We're a leader in low-impact sustainable grounds maintenance strategies. Our mission is to prudently and I want to stress prudently transition the grounds maintenance industry to acquire more sustainable practices. Some of the applications are for commercial crews who service municipalities, schools, and residential properties. Uh, we do this in a, in a few different ways. A, a couple listed here is our AGSA Green Zone Certification uh, Initiative, that's property transition. And then two is our AGSA service professional certification. That's working with people and educating them of how to transition uh, away from internal combustion where economically and workload feasible. And then another thing we do is called AFTC. It's AGSA field tested uh, certified. We test independently of manufacturers, uh, their platforms uh, to really understand uh, that they're safe, what their thresholds are, and if they're a good candidate to invest in to, re, uh, to get an ROI on that investment. Okay, so how did we get here? Um, right now, uh, there's regulations, bans, restrictions, primarily on gas leaf blowers. Uh, these bans go back uh, decades in some areas, but just recently, it's sweeping the country. Uh, there are well over 200 and counting. It's a very well organized movement. I think industry uh, really does need to pay attention to this because there is an issue here that that cannot be denied. And also, it, uh, aside from just leaf blower bans and regulations, there's now state level uh, regulation on on a, a, an entire category of small gas engines. So we really need to start to pay attention to this, especially folks in the gas industry. Okay, barriers to the new technology. Um, you know, the, the gas industry is entrenched. Uh, there's a lot of uh, convenient infrastructure and we are reliant um, on fossil fuels for this industry. Uh, there's technological barriers. Uh, some of the tools uh, just have not met the workload capability for some of the workload demands. Uh, so AGSA, just to be clear, uh, we, we do know that there is a need to use some gas tools for workloads where electric um, has not been able uh, to satisfy that given workload. Uh, the upfront costs and investment is definitely a barrier. Uh, we try to educate people if they take care of their tools and we have um, education that help meet that end, uh, that they will receive an ROI return on their investment and eventually get into a gravy period where they're experiencing better profit margins on maintenance. And then of course, like we're doing today, awareness, education and training. All right, so coming from the gas industry myself, uh, th this is what we developed as our top 10 impact issues with gas operations. Emissions at the uh, top left, of course, there's health risk to the workers and community. Uh, noise, though, at the top and in the center. 
uh, that is why AGSA actually uh, started our campaign was to help mitigate noise issues uh, from this industry. If you're a worker, vibration. I've used gas tools for a large portion of my life. Um, I have numbness in both hands and um, definitely there's going to be some benefits to using electric from a worker perspective. And then lesser known stuff is at the bottom uh, left toxic and solid waste components, which are a result of maintaining small gas engines cradle to grave. We'll, we'll go into a little bit of that as well. Okay, so we're gonna focus on noise though for the next few slides. And here's a video uh, that a mom of, of, of a kid uh, who attends uh, a school here in uh, LA County. Uh, she took this video and sent it to us. Okay, I've played this video many times. This was done uh, actually a couple years ago. And again, it's very important not to demonize the worker using the tool. Uh, we have to take a look at uh, some of the alternative equipment that exists and get it into their hands. But can you imagine uh, your child is, is in the classroom and that work is being done during school hours? And to further on noise, this is us. This is us in our typical uh, suburban, urban neighborhoods. We're pretty close together. You can be inside your house, you can be outside of your house. And then here come the gas crews. And uh, your neighbors, uh, most of them may have uh, companies that come and do their maintenance across the street, to the left, to the right of you. That's kind of a visual of what gas maintenance, the noise profile looks like. If they were all electric, this is what it would look like. Um, and then we're gonna show you in a couple of slides what that sounds like. But it's important to know uh, first and foremost that hearing loss is um, permanent and irreversible. So most of the gas tools that are on the market today, they're going to exceed thresholds by the EPA, NIOSH, ANSI and OSHA uh, for safe working environments. That's why all of these agencies insist and, and, and follow up that workers are wearing uh, the proper hearing protection. Um, with gas, uh, I'm sorry, with most electric tools, they're gonna be, uh, the DB levels are gonna be below those thresholds, although AGSA still recommends hearing protection uh, for workers using even electric tools because they are at the source of the noise. Another important component of noise is the frequency. Gas tools operate at low frequencies. Do your research, please. Low frequencies travel long distances and penetrate barriers. If you ever pull up next to a car and they have a boom box going, um, that uh, vibration you feel go right through your body and your eardrums, that's low frequency right there. For high frequency, which are electric tools, I use the mosquito analogy. Some of you uh, have seen my, my presentations, but I'm gonna keep hitting it home when the mosquito is right next to your ear, you can hear it loud, but as it distances from you, that noise profile drops off and then a foot away, foot and a half, you can't find the mosquito. And this is an example of that. This is a 74 inch industrial riding mower. It's all electric, it's a mean green mower. And let's look at that and hear that noise profile. Video was not doctored, we just stayed in the same place and then let the video uh, film or let the uh, iPhone uh, film the video. And then you can see right there a very clear example and hear that very clear. 
that looks like. Uh, here's another one. Okay, uh, not only are we doing training sessions here, first time users on this Ego Z, we're also continually testing these tools for their commercial viability in these unique situations. Here you can see this is an HOA. They value quiet. You see the size of this grass? Till next time, Ags are raw. All right, so I was following uh, that Ego uh, riding mower and yes, you can hear it because I was just a few feet away from it. But when I stopped and let the tool, uh, the mower uh, kind of distance from us, again, it's that high frequency component uh, and that profile. That's much quieter. Okay, so speaking about other impacts of gas, I'm just gonna go right into it because I know uh, we, we, we're on a, 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 you know, we have to be in on time here, but this is the solid and toxic waste component. This is something I used to do when I had my gas business, not proud of it. We have the filter right off the carburetor. They get a little gas and oil on it. We put that into the gas, swish it around. You can see how dirty it gets. This is the process of which you extend the life of the filter. Right. What happens to this gas that now has the grit, the grease, the dirt inside of it? Normally we can uh, pour it in some dirt or uh, we throw it away in a trash can. It could end up in a landfill as well or poured into the bushes. Sure. Okay, so that's Jeff. And I actually um, saw Jeff yesterday. He does my neighbor's yard. When he comes, he has some electric tools, but I loan him uh, 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 some additional ones so he can do the maintenance completely electric when he's next to my house. We have the shadowing uh, gardening crews uh, for about a decade now in LA County. Uh, this is conservative. Uh, we estimate that one worker can account for 50 pieces of solid waste that have toxic residues on them and that end up in landfills. So again, it's not just air pollution and it's not just noise. And then of course, addressing worker health coming from the industry myself, uh, this was um, another driver uh, that, that was really near and dear uh, to myself, working with gas tools, understanding what they've done uh, for my health uh, that, that we want to help all of the workers out there improve their health by using this amazing technology that exists today. And here are some of the solutions. Uh, here's an example of uh, institutional AGSA uh, green zone certification. This is the city of South Pasadena. They were the first. That's why uh, we put them up as the example today. Although there's uh, over 25 institutional green zones established to date. And how we did it is we worked with their public works and their vendor. We did the beta at uh, this uh, nearly 10 acre park, Garfield Park. It went so well uh, that we met with the city. The city said, hey, uh, how fast can we do all the other properties? Uh, we set a, a goal to do it within a year and we were able to actually do it within nine months. Back then it was a very big deal, uh, mayor, city council, environmental groups, and even members of Congress and, and the California State Senate were present at this ceremony. Uh, just to let everybody know, this is real. It's not for show, it really is for dough. Any vendor that wants to do business in the city of South Pasadena needs to be AGSA certified or equivalent and they need to adhere and keep up with the AGSA Green Zone standard, uh, which for this particular Green Zone project is all routine maintenance needs to be done with battery electric and people powered tools. All of our uh, projects come with ELF reports, stands for Environmental Landscape Footprint. We're able to give that snapshot of the before and after. We measure uh, CO2 reductions, criteria pollution, PM, um, and then also the, the fuel spillage and the toxic and solid waste component. 
Continuing with solutions, let's take a quick look at technology. Here's your typical gas technology. This is a Briggs and Stratton, I believe, uh, four horsepower lawnmower engine. When you convert to electric, uh, basically it's just a few components. You have the battery, you have the controller, the protection circuitry, a BMS, a battery management system uh, there on the left. Uh, that uh, powers the motor, which turns the turbines, the blades, the string, if you, if you will. Um, electric, we all know, it's more efficient, it's more simple, and it's eventually more profitable if you can take care of your tools. Now, just because the systems are more simple doesn't mean they don't have a lot of technology. As you'll hear from our guests, there is a lot of technology packed into these tools, and uh, we can attest to that. Here's an example of a relationship with um, a private company. They're Ads of Service Pro certified. We did uh, what you call the first robotic mower green zone with the Langton Group and AOS. This is in the state of Illinois. Uh, this is at a 96 unit HOA. Uh, they're using Husqvarna auto mowers. It's about 30 serviceable acres. And as you can see, some of the uh, benefits, uh, eight and a half tons of smog forming emissions are taken out and reduced every year. Um, 27 tons of CO2. Um, and then um, noise is lowered two to fourfold, 40 to 70%, of course, improved worker and community health. And we mitigate that fuel spillage and that toxic and solid waste component. And I visited uh, my, uh, our AGSA's green zone over here just about a month ago. And here's a little taste of what these automowers are doing. Okay, Dan May of American Green Zone Alliance here at the HOA, AGSA's certified green zone through the Langton Group. Look at that little guy right there. Did that little patch. Now he's going to the next patch it can actually cross hardscape and go and mow this other section. You don't hear it, no emissions. It's just amazing. Till next time. Okay, so we really have to vet the technology. We have to see for ourselves that it works separate of the manufacturers. And then our findings are then passed along uh, to our Alliance members and then everybody else who is able to access our information. What's really cool about this one as well is where there's not um, uh, charging infrastructure, these mowers are charging on these solar designs right here. Uh, basically, when they're tired, they come in, they take their nap, they recharge, and they're recharging on this system that is powered entirely by solar. Okay, so moving forward, um, solutions. This is working with the men and women of the industry. You see here a group, I mean, this is really tough to deal with when you're right next to it, but these, these people are just trying to beautify our neighborhoods, keep our property values high. It's important, again, not to demonize workers, to embrace everybody. We all come together. Everybody's a stakeholder. And AGSA is about solutions and education. Um, this is where we're really making uh, the biggest bang for our buck, embracing, again, the workforce, empowering them with information. And I, I can tell you right now, a lot of our conversions, some of them are, uh, uh, most of them are coming up and saying, wow, I feel better. I don't smell like a gas can when I go home. And they really have uh, been able to make that transition. But this is an important part of it is this engagement. As you can see here, you have the old on the left, the newer on the right. These are very high volume crews in Southern California. And we've taught them things like mount your tools, lock them up, they're more expensive up front. I can tell you right now, these high volume mow, blow and go crews, we're shadowing them every single day. We're verifying and we can uh, testify on the durability of these electric tools. These ones that you see in this image are going close to two years old. Um, it's very important to engage this workforce 
provide them with information. So when they make these big investments that they're going to be successful. That's why we have our uh, service pro certification. This is online, it's in Spanish, it's in English. And we do this with our nonprofit um, collaboration with quiet communities. And they get uh, certificates uh, which, which identify them as clean air operators. And it's very important to do this on many levels, but I'm just gonna give you some of the uh, ugly ones. Uh, here is a situation where they forewent certification. They called us eight months later, and this is what we walked into. It's really hard to look at this because it's a disaster waiting to happen from a safety perspective, but also you're looking at you know, roughly eight, eight nine, maybe $10,000 worth of tools, and this is how they're being treated. It's very unlikely they'll get to their ROI when this happens. This is ideal. Uh, this is a situation where we help set up a very clean, neat, and uh, safe charging infrastructure. Um, talking about lithium batteries really quick, a couple of slides dedicated to this. We are closing the loop on this. We're making sure that manufacturers are able to retrieve their batteries uh, through their dealerships. And we're working on projects like you see here. These are Tesla Model 3 cells. They're used Tesla Model 3 cells. We converted this greens mower at our green zone golf course uh, this July, uh, next month, it's going to be an entire year that these used Tesla Model 3 cells have been powering this greens mower every single day because it, it is ran seven days a week uh, with no issues, period, whatsoever. So we're very excited about uh, the, the repurposing um, uh, market for lithium cells uh, coming online. Uh, this was this morning. <laughs> I just threw these in because I was out there in the field this morning uh, with Kevin and Kevin Esparza's uh, maintenance service. There's Angel. Uh, you can see that Who's Varna hedge trimmer in the back of the truck. Now I know you see a gas blower and you see gas cans, but we call this uh, bridging, uh, br uh, bridge tools. These um, uh, line trimmers and these hedge trimmers have actually uh, been bridge tools to get them to look at other tools. Of course, the, the gas leak blowers are the hardest to yank away from them, but we're happy to tell everybody that they have invested in some of the electric blowers as well. And then here's a, a, a quick video of, of what I, I took just this morning. Dan May about here. Shadowing our hardcore maintenance crews here in Southern California. Gorgeous day. Uh, we do have LAPD's finest. All right, back over here. And you can see Angel here using this Boost Barna electric, commercial battery electric line trimmer. And as he moves away from us, uh, you can barely hear it. What's great is they're integrating and implementing electric tools on, on their routes. Not fully electric yet, but we're getting there. Okay, till next time, Ags are raw. Okay, uh, Jack, I know you're watching. Uh, we always tell them do not take uh, the, the guard off, uh, but they always end up doing it. Uh, just a quick uh, snapshot on uh, cost of operation benefits. The gas here in California is nearly $5 a gallon. This is going to be conservative. If, if they're running like an Echo PB770 uh, two-stroke leaf blower, they're going to be operating it at $1.25 an hour minimum. Uh, but their electric counterpart uh, that they're using, it's going to be around 24 cents an hour based on the cost per kilowatt hour. So you just plug in those hours and then you're going to see what kind of savings um, you're able to receive when you're using uh, those electric blowers. Now, this stands across the board for all electric tools. Let's take a quick snapshot at a 60 inch. Um, mower, riding mower. Basically, the uh, the average cost to operate a gas zero turn is going to be anywhere from five to seven dollars an hour. 
And then for the electric, it's going to be anywhere from 60 to 85 cents an hour. And if we look at this, let's look at this 10 year chart. If you were to operate uh, the oldest uh, unkept gas zero turn after 10 years, your cost with maintenance and gas can be up to $95,000 over a 10 year span. Now, best case scenario is it's well kept, it's fuel injected, um, and you have the lowest cost per gas in the country. You're looking after 10 years, about $44,000. If you look at the electric there though, over its 10 year lifetime, you're going to spend $25,000 to $27,000 over 10 years in maintenance and cost of electricity. Those ROI ranges are gonna be from a year and a half to uh, just under four years, depending on what region of the country you're in. And then finally coming down the home stretch, it's not just the gas industry. This is on us, homeowners. Take a look at this. We need a paradigm shift in our thinking of what our landscapes need to be. Do they need to be this, hyper manicured? Do we need to eat off of the property once it's done? This is neat, um, it's well kept, but to me it looks bland and, and boring. Uh, here's an example of a yard where it is well kept, but it's rustic, it's beautiful. And yes, they have leaves on the grass. They allow the, the beauty of the leaves to stay there. And the, the maintenance people are allowed to mulch those leaves. They don't have to blow that lawn off uh, with, with a 900 and CFM uh, gas blower uh, and make it look like that. So I think the education needs to trickle down to the homeowners as well. Uh, you can also take some turf out plant like pollinator gardens, if you will, friendly gardens, uh, definitely uh, something that adds beauty and then uh, biodiversity to your gardens. Landscaper, uh, they have been conditioned to think that we want this. This is the aesthetic standard that still exists today, in my opinion. The homeowner, sometimes they don't know what they want because working all the time, uh, they want to keep up with the Joneses. Uh, they want to make sure the property values stay high. I can assure you the difference between this and this is not going to make or break a property value. So in the end, it's all about communication. What steps can landscapers and gardeners do today? Okay, you can communicate with your gardener. See if they can stop the use of gas leaf blowers, mulch those leaves, use breaks and room, uh, uh, rakes and brooms uh, where feasible. Even if they're using electric blowers, use them efficiently, judiciously. Homeowners, will you consider paying your gardener a little bit more money to go electric? And then gardeners, uh, they need to consider how important they are to the quality of life in, in the communities that they serve. And that has been my presentation for today. And I hope I came in on time, Brian. You're muted, Brian. Thanks, Dan. Um, that was fantastic. We're gonna turn it over to uh, Jason now from Ego Tools. And there've been uh, questions piling up in the chat. We've been trying to answer them as we go along, but we will have some Q and A at the end. So we'll, we'll pick out a few juicy ones uh, for the end there, but take it away, uh, Jason. Okay, can you hear me? All good. All right, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to speak. Dan, great job. Uh, what I'm going to talk about here a little bit is ego and who we are and what we're about and kind of where we came from. And Dan does a great job on the noise and the ordinances and, and things of that nature and the education part. So I want to talk a little bit about ego um, and our background and our story. Why the involvement? So ego is a brand created by a company called Shervon. So this brand was born many years ago. Uh, we were looking to outsource it to other businesses. You know, this is 10, 12 years ago, and there just wasn't that interest at that time. And we were confident that we had a great idea. So we developed our very first own brand and again called Ego. So we noticed that there was a gap in the market for high performance battery technology. 
in the outdoor power equipment industry. So we went to work in creating our technology and we went after technology that delivers, right? So here's a video that uh, we think is pretty cool. This is one of the best selling uh, gas handheld blowers on the- Jason, sorry, we, we aren't seeing your screen there, Jason. Oh, you're not? Oh, okay. Just a minute. Anything now? Not yet, no. Uh, yeah, it's all right. Yeah, it's showing that it's sharing on my end. Let's see. There we go. We good? Yes. Okay. yes. You think after a year like this last year, everybody would be the pros at this, right? So <laughs> 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 I apologize. Um, so I'll go back here to kind of where I left off and um, start this video here again. But we went after the technology. We wanted technology to deliver the power and performance of gas, right? So we, we'd like to show this demonstration here. It's our blower on the left, that it's a high selling gas blower on the right and the performance that battery can actually deliver. And uh, our, our motto is the power and performance of gas and without the noise, fuss, and fumes. That's what we're after. Deliver the best technology that we can without those issues right there and giving you that performance. Um, we, in looking at the technology and that gap that was in the uh, battery segment of OPE, we wanted the industry's most advanced technology. So we created a battery that's been in the works for many years now. And there's a lot of different types of technology on board, but I want to point out four of them that I think is um, uh, very important to the, to the battery world. And just starting from the left there, shock resistant design. This battery is built uh, to take the abuse of everyday use out in the landscape segment or the environment, right? So it's got great quality construction. We implemented an intelligent power management system. And what that's going to do is that's going to maximize your power, your performance, and your runtime. That's going to, that's what's going to deliver the power performance or more than what gas can give you today. And we're believers in that and we talk about it and we stand behind that. And then our arc lithium 56 volt design. We we did when we designed this battery, we didn't just create a brick and drop a bunch of battery cells in there and say, here we go, we got us a battery. We went in and designed it. That was going to work and did a little thing did some things differently internally and what this does is it, it prevents overheating and then we have the keep cool cell technology that goes a step further from that overheating and i think we all know lithium it dies fast from heat right so this this keep cool cell technology pushes heat away and what that does is it's going to give you longer life it's going to give you faster charge times and a longer run times when you're out there using it on the jobs, no matter if it's a homeowner or if it's a landscape contractor. So a lot of great technology that we went into building uh, our batteries, okay? And then ease and hassle-free, right? So that's the thing about battery. It's easy, it's hassle-free. You know, Dan hit a lot on about the oil and the gas and the things that the, the contractors, even a homeowner has to do. And we wanted that ease and hassle-free. And, and with that, we were able to obtain number one rated battery platform. And that comes from our purchasers, from our experts that we work with out in the field and from influencers. And today we're rated uh, you know, best by some of the experts out there today with, uh, with the power performance and the value that we deliver. And this is from consumer reports here. We're currently number one rated out of five out of these seven categories with our products, which is great. And then the other two uh, were, were considered best buy. So our technology is delivering, it's getting the, um, the remarks from the, the testers out there, if you, say, if you will. And that's one thing Dan's doing, as he mentioned, he's shadowing these guys, he's working with them, showing, showing him, them these great brands, right? And then what I think is most important is rated best by the users. I mean, put it in a person's hand and let's get their feedback. And you know, we're getting about 4.7 to 4.9 stars on reviews. We have the most reviews of any brand with the highest uh, uh, return on, on rating. So we're very excited about that. The user speaks the volume, right? And they help drive the sales as well. So with that, the market is growing. I want to say when I started here with this company about four and a half years ago, we had 20 to 25 tools that all of our batteries will fit no matter what size that you buy. Well, today we're over 50 and it's gonna to continue to grow. We're getting into bigger and bigger uh, uh, product categories, right? So it's uh, very interesting to see what's happening. The 
cordless growth has accelerated to a 30% increase, uh, which is up 8% or 30% market share, which is up 8% from 2019 and up 10% from 2018. So we're seeing, we're seeing those customers come in and buy it. They, they get their hands on it. They see that it's got the power and the performance to perform or outperform the gas side of the world. And uh, the numbers, numbers speak for themselves. And with that, we're not going to stop, right? The product continues to get better. This is technology. We've you know, used that word a couple of times now. It's uh, a lot of things going into these uh, batteries and the tools. And these are some of our recent innovations that we're very proud of. Uh, we got a new 21-inch mower that just came out this year. We redesigned it. It's got a, what we call the select cut blade system. It's a twin blade system underneath the deck. And it's giving you the mulching and the bagging better than what a gas powered unit can do. We now have a 650 CFM blower. It's the industry's most powerful handheld blower out there today, uh, at least that I'm aware of anyway. There may be some others that are, that are getting up there, but, but we've got a great blower with a ton of power. And then something I think is very unique uh, to an ego owner is what we call the Nexus power station. So if you already owned some Eagle tools and you have Eagle batteries. Now you have a power station or, or a generator, if you want to use that term, and it's quite clean power. So it's great to use if you're camping, tailgating, or maybe the, some storms come in and you're without power for a while. Plug in your refrigerator, a TV, your Wi-Fi, whatever it may be to get you through those times. And then just innovating into the chainsaw world, we, we launched the world's first auto tensioning technology on our new 18-inch bar chainsaw. And we are the only cordless uh, manufacturer with a two-stage snow thrower that gives you the power or more gas. So a lot of cool things that we've done, and it's just going to continue to get better. And one thing that, uh, that we're very excited about, this was many years in the making, one of the most anticipated launches from our users and just from the team here with Ego, and that's our new zero-turn mower. So this, the technology is there to give you what you need to mow your yard with a zero turn. It doesn't always have to be gas powered product. The, this new, what we call the Z6, it's equivalent to 22 horsepower. It's got great runtime, two acres, three acres, depending on the, the amp hour size of batteries that you put in there and how many that are, um, are powering the unit today. And then I want to point it out, you can go to egopowerplus.com. You can download our uh, 2021 product catalog. There's a lot of ego owner resources there where you can register your product. There's videos, warranty information, uh, get support, things to that nature. And then obviously all of our products are listed on there. And for you commercial landscapers, you can go to our commercial segment on our website and check out our commercial pro tools as well. So with that, I thank you. Look forward to visiting eaglepowerplus.com and thanks for the opportunity to speak today. We appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. That was, that was fantastic. Uh, we're going to turn it over to Jack here now, and um, just want to remind people we were, keep, we're trying to answer some questions. We're keeping track of them too. I think we'll have some time for some Q and A here at the end. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Jack Easterly, uh, brand manager of the pro handheld category. Um, so I want to do a first, a quick introduction of Husqvarna. So maybe uh, a lot of you have heard of the brand before, but I want to give a history because not many people know uh, deep into the history of our brand. Um, it's over 330 years old and it's actually our headquarters is um, in Husqvarna, Sweden, which is spelled with a K instead of a Q. Uh, fun Jack, fact. Jack, you're not, sorry, your slides aren't on full screen uh, share mode there. Uh, Thanks. How about now? Yeah, that's good. I gave, that's I gave everyone a sneak peek. So. <laughs> um, so we've made a variety of products over the past 330 years here, um, uh, relevant to outdoor power equipment, chainsaws in 1959, uh, our first robotic mower, the auto mower in 1995. Uh, and then we actually began investing in battery product in as early as 2012 uh, to support eco-friendly operation globally. Again, we operate uh, in almost every country um, hundreds of thousands of products, actually, if you put in parts and accessories. Um, and beyond that, our first chain factory, 2016, our all-wheel drive automower, 2018, and then the mad saw, the non-conductive dielectric pole saw in 2021. Um, here's the factory from a long time ago, but if you pay, pay attention to the sign in the middle, 
This is what that looks like today. So it looks very similar where a lot of the manufacturing occurs. Um, most of the, pretty much all of the professional products are manufactured here. Uh, we actually use hydro energy next to the, the office. And on the right there, it's called the Smedgen. It's a 300 year old building where a lot of the original manufacturing was uh, that has been renovated and we actually still hold meetings there uh, today. I uh, like this picture. This is the model 535 IFR, uh, but it really represents really who we are. I mean, it is quality, durability, uh, and performance. So again, all of our pro products are IPX4 certified for weatherproofing. Um, all of the research and development brought pro professionals in from the beginning of the projects and working with them throughout all of the, all the product development process. Um, so what, our output of any product we make is really you know, built by professionals for professionals. Uh, I also want to highlight, we now have all the core landscaping tools, you know, product gaps is one thing you have to at least have the product, but we have a premium product in every product group. We have a string trimmer, handheld and extended hedge trimmers, stick edger, handheld blower, most importantly, a backpack blower. We'll talk more on that later. Pole pruners and different variations, both fixed and telescoping. Power and concrete saws of different sizes, anywhere from an eight inch blade up to a 14 inch blade. Chain saws, both top and rear handle saws for the arborists. Uh, and also 35 cc equivalent brush cutters and clearing saws that are brand new of last year. So also one big thing of the mindset of battery period. Um, I mean, this is, this is what I see when I see one of our batteries. This is our VLI 300. It's roughly equivalent to a fuel tank. Um, not many people see it this way, but you need to begin to see it this way. You're really carrying around stored energy and lots of exciting things to come in the battery space of how we Bring our markets to bat um, bring our batteries to market, and that will help people see this um, more like buying fuel up front when they're looking at batteries. Uh, so a little bit, little tech stuff on our batteries um, here. One important thing when you're shopping around, regardless of any brand, you want to look at the voltage and the amp hour, and multiplying those together, you get what's called the watt hour, which is the bottom bolt number here. And that's really the number you want to use when you're comparing different batteries on run times and performance. Um, ultimately, you see here. Starting from the smallest battery, giving shorter runtime all the way up to our largest uh, backpack battery. Again, the one in the middle is our highly, most highly recommended battery, the BLI 300, around 340 watt hours. Um, this in some tools is longer runtime than a fuel tank. We don't wanna go too long because then you exceed some other components such as the bump heads on string trimmers when they go back to reload, unless they're carrying extra on their waist. Um, refills, re water brace, especially in hot climates. That's always important for them to go back and, and uh, take care of themselves and get a water break. But again, we have also active cooling. So all of our products actually have a fan running air through the battery and over the cells of every tool to keep them cool, uh, regardless of the climate. Again, full suite of tools. I'm gonna highlight our string trimmer, the 520 ILX. Again, all IPX4. You can see this being used next to a commercial property. Uh, it's important regardless if it's residential or commercial especially now more than ever with work from home. Being quiet is imperative and desired by especially the comments that I see just on this, this meeting alone. Um, where can I get my landscape to run battery powered equipment? Um, a lot of these benefits outweigh them, but for the operator are also on the top of landscape companies' minds as well. When we ask them, you know, what are the top three benefits? Sometimes it's maintenance, but a lot of times it's their operators. Less vibrations, there's no exhaust in the person's face and to the world. Um, no heat that they can rest their arm on, for example, on certain power heads. Um, and again, it really is just much better for the operator. It's better for everyone. Um, our backpack blower, uh, there's lots of noise pollution restrictions, not only environmental, but the noise pollution is really at the top of the list to have a blower that's below 65 dBA from 50 feet. I'm sure many of you have heard that figure before, county by county. Uh, our blower is at 61 dBA. That's the requirement. It has to be below. Um, so it's Coincidentally, that cuts out pretty much every gas blower for the most part, about 98% of them. Um, we're launching one also with Bluetooth. This is very important um, going forward with our fleet services application, which is uh, you can access from your phone or your desktop for your professional landscape company, or even just a homeowner with Husqvarna Connect. Um, so with this, we can actually track carbon footprint by tool remotely, and it's then stored in the database and exportable. Uh, it's very neat stuff, so please stay tuned for that uh, in the future. And I saw a lot of comments about run times and why can't we get backpack blowers or anyone get backpack blowers to those levels like a 70 or 80 cc petrol blower. Um, a lot of that's technology and a lot of it's the operator comfort again. 
carrying that uh, carrying that amount of weight. We could absolutely make a blower that powerful, but it may only run for a very brief amount of time, and it may really hurt the operator to carry it for a long period of time. Um, so right now, battery blowers are really perfect for what we consider commercial maintenance, which may be a seven to nine day cadence uh, visiting that customer's property when they're really edging, mowing, trimming, and blowing uh, that property and blowing really light material. Uh, next is an edger. This was kind of the last piece in the lineup, but actually absolutely, absolutely a core tool for the landscapers um, and also a great thing for the aesthetics of any lawn, whether that be residential or commercial. Uh, this is our 325 ILK with our ECA 850 attachment. Um, that's what you see here pictured. Also hedge trimmers were heavily invested in those as well, both with the handheld 520i HD60. And what you see here is the 520i HD3, which is a extended hedge trimmer with a fully articulating 135 degree head with locked fixed positions. And also a 520i HT4 is our newest addition, which is a telescopic hedge trimmer. Uh, this is big for not only the environment and safety running battery product, but for safety for the worker. This could prevent a ladder being brought on site. You know, no one wants to have an employee up on a ladder, especially with an elongated tool uh, reaching in tough to get areas. So having a telescopic uh, product like this is really important. One also thing, I, one other thing I should highlight is that with battery powered, we're able to eliminate a lot of extra moving parts such as shafts, which is why we have a telescopic battery head trimmer and not a gas powered telescopic head trimmer, for example. So inside all of these shafts of our battery tools, there aren't internal drive shafts. There are just wires going to the brush, brushless motor uh, at the top that is mounted directly to either a gearbox or right to the sprocket for a blade system, depending on which tool it is. Um, pole pruners, we have pictured here is the 530i PT5, which is a telescopic pole pruner. Again, there is no shaft rotating inside of this. It's very lightweight, easy to maneuver. And up top at the gearbox, at the uh, cutting deck, you can see there's a brushless motor right near the bar and chain oil reservoir. We also have the 530i P4, that is a fixed pole saw, not pictured here, but also available. Um, this may, for many of you that are landscapers out there, this is a replacement for the Sprite bottle with a two stroke mix in it to carry around for long uh, job sites that you need to operate on. Um, so this is a battery belt that we offer that carries extra batteries because we know in some properties, especially large HOAs, commercial properties, you may be very far from that trailer. And the traditional sense, they might plan and plot gas cans around the property for each customer to go to. And they say, well, I'll roughly be here when I need to refill or carry it on their hip, which is not advised. Um, but you can't leave expensive batteries regardless of the brand Batteries are expensive um, to purchase. So we can't quite just be leaving batteries all over the property. So we have this solution uh, to carry along with the user. Next, I wanna give you a very recent launch. In the past 48 hours, we've launched um, Ciora, which is a large area robotic mower by Husqvarna. And I have a quick video that's kind of cool from an actual end user uh, to highlight this. So I assume your volume's already on if you can hear me. So we'll jump to that and show this quick video. After this slide, I forgot this was in here. So this is actually another product that you can hook up and monitor remotely from a phone or computer. So for, for example, this mower will do up to 20 acres. So this can, you can plot out different areas. This would be obviously a sports field. I saw a lot of talk, or um, Dan, you mentioned running a hedge trimmer outside of a school. This is another thing with preventing uh, loud mowers. So again, these things are virtually silent, but more importantly, they can operate during the nighttime. So we'll watch this quick video from a real end user and wrap it up. Imagine pitching up for work at six o'clock in the morning and 20% and of your work being done for that day. How much more could you get done in your time if you didn't have to mow your fairways because they were done at night? Our golfers want to play golf in the day when the weather's like it is now. Um, and normally we've got seven or eight guys running around on machines trying to maintain the golf course. If we can get large areas maintained during the night, um, quietly, not disturbing our neighbours. Uh, it gives us the ability to get on the quieter stuff in the daytime. The, the type of things that we, we're always struggling to catch up with because we're always prioritising cutting and maintaining the main playing surfaces of the golf course. The running costs of the system obviously is greatly reduced compared to a sort of diesel hybrid machine. So that's a, a massive benefit going forward. The EPOS system would give us the ability to maintain these areas on the golf course without the field cable in the ground, which 
gives us two benefits. If we do any aeration, we don't have to worry about hitting the steel cable and breaking the geofence. It also means that if we want to make adjustments in cutting lines on the golf course, we can go out there and, and remap areas quite quickly. Definitely see autonomous mowers coming into this industry. I think some of the restrictions that were there perhaps before with charging and, and geofencing and stuff like that have all been eliminated and obviously the capability of how big an area Siora can cover, I think people just need to see it and when they see it they'll, they'll get to understand and, and see the benefits of it. All right, uh, that wraps up, I think. Hopefully it was on time, maybe one minute over. Um, I appreciate your time. Please check out Husqvarna.com. I know I didn't dive too into technical details, but again, everything is available, full specs, uh, and everything for all of our products at Husqvarna.com, as well as any retailer, uh, which you can view on the dealer locator uh, as well. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thanks, Jack. And. Um... We got maybe a couple minutes here. We're going to try to wrap up here, not too long after one, but uh, uh, I know there were a couple of um, questions. I think, um, see Jack, can you stop sharing your screen there? There we go, thanks. Um, one question that I'm going to answer and then I'm going to turn a couple over, over to you other guys or jump in on this if you want. But one question I, I saw was, um, should I wait till the end of life of my current gas powered equipment if you own it yourself before switching to a, um, battery powered? I would say emphatically, do not wait. Um, you know, I think we have been trained in, in environmental service to hold on to things as long as possible. And that's usually true because these things are most of the environmental footprint from making, let's say, the clothes we wear or, you know, consumable things like dishes or furniture. Most of the carbon that comes from those was from making it. But in the case of um, these devices that burn fuel, most of the emissions come from using it, not making it in the first place. Probably 10 to 20 times more emissions will come from using it in rough numbers uh, from everything I've looked at. One year of operation is pretty much the same amount of carbon as it took to make the thing in the first place. So get rid of it as soon as you can. I would say put it out of surface. Do not give it to somebody else to run. Put a hole in it if you can, recycle it for material value and get yourself a gas one as soon as possible. Uh, sorry, a battery one. Um, <laughs> I want to, um, there was a, a lot of questions and Dan, maybe this is one for you about um, battery backpack blowers. And, and Jack, you did a good job of kind of talking a little bit about the noise and power issues. We know these, the, the gas powered ones can just deliver unbelievable force, but they come at unbelievable loud volumes. Um, Dan, can you give us some uh, experience from your side about how we get over this typical thing we hear from contractors? To get, as soon as the, this is what I hear all the time, as soon as the electric ones are as powerful as the gas ones, I'll switch. And so can you tell us why that is not the right way to be thinking about things? Yeah, uh, I just want to go back real quick to the first one. We agree <laughs> with you because you can you can be uh, spending anywhere from 40 to 150 dollars bringing your gas tools in for service and that's not accounting for the the cost of operation of them so i agree with you on that first question it would be prudent uh you know if it's aged even a few years to go ahead get rid of it and get into something electric understand your operating costs and factor that in as far as the um workload uh production capability of the uh, top electric blowers that exist on the market. In AGS's world, we have found them entirely adequate uh, to green zone. Uh, for example, we have an entire school district that is green zone certified, AGS is green zone certified. It's 138 serviceable acres. There is a massive amount of hardscape. So in that transition, we have really been able to help the crew understand that you don't need all of that power for roughly 70% of their workload, which is dry hardscape. Uh, there are some gas concessions in these large areas, primarily for the fall season. 
And what we do is we have convinced um, all of our projects to get rid of two stroke entirely. And, and if they do need um, that uh, gas blower for that seasonal workload, which is not routine maintenance, where the leaves are falling uh, just crazy for two months, uh, then they, they've gone to a four stroke option. Great. Perfect. Um, hey, Brian, I, 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 I had a time commitment that I'd let the guys know about, but I, I moved it to 115. So we have a couple of extra minutes. Oh, great. great. Um, I, I did have a question and we got so many questions in here today that we'll try to, you know, field as many as we can in the next 10 minutes. Um, one, one question and, and um, that's probably hard to answer briefly, but uh, people are asking, you know, how do we, um, how do we convince both the, the landscaping crews that electric is viable and, and then how do we convince like schools and other other players that they want to do this. So I'll open that up to everyone. Um, well, from Axe's perspective, it, it's really not self-serving. We know there's a lot of resources out there that give examples of this, but we do have a structured program in place that helped transition. We've done universities, we've done entire cities, we've done entire school districts, and we have a robust residential green zone initiative uh, where we're going on over 300 residents who have made this commitment and it's growing. Uh, so they can basically visit us and, and find out some of the things we have going or just go online and, and start to search uh, other options that are out there. Uh, but we, we definitely understand that it's, it's, it's an education and engagement uh, component that can help bring the, the incredible technology that Shervon and Husvarna have and then uh, help, help uh, that facilitation occur. I know there, you know, there are some, um, there are some national uh, franchises that do uh, all electric maintenance like clean air lawn care that are available in many places. But I think uh, one thing that I would advise people to do if, if you have someone who does your own yard is to ask them to switch. I mean, they, you, you might be surprised because my guess is that these, I know it was the case in my case, at least where the, our contractor had been hearing this from other people. And so um, he was willing to do it. So, and you might have to help a little bit. That's another option you can make is, and I know Dan recommends this is, you know, you can have your own tools that your contractor uses on your property. Um, so I think it's worth thinking about those kind of creative ways to get your lands, the person you already have a relationship with to think about making this transition. Or maybe it's just one tool to start with like Dan was talking about. Uh, we've got a couple um, questions in, uh, I was gonna say real quick on, on the difference between, you know, a corded and cordless, you know, electric. Of course, corded has been around a uh, long time. Yeah, does anybody have any thoughts on, you know, why, why anybody would do a corded one besides maybe price? Well, I, I, I think price factors into that, but it's also uh, size. If you have a smaller property and you have an exterior plug, uh, then, then it's probably prudent uh, to, to use corded tools uh, because they're a lot more cost effective and you don't, you don't have to, um, if it's a small enough property where extension cords are, are easy to use, then I see a lot of that happening because of the smaller property size and because uh, they are more cost effective. Um, hey, Jason, can you uh, let people know where they can purchase Ego Tools? Yeah, so Ego's got uh, quite a few different retail options. Uh, if you look at the box store side of the business, we are available at Lowe's and then we are available at most Ace Hardwares across the country. And then we have a lot of independent outdoor power equipment dealerships across the country who are making the switch of stocking battery brands within their locations. Uh, so it's all across the country. You can go to egopowerplus.com and click on Shop Ego, and you can click on which type of retailer you're looking for, and it identifies if they're doing service, things of that nature, and uh, find the nearest one in your area. Jack, can you, can you answer the same question for who's Varna? Yes, so for professional um, battery products, they're available only at our independent retail, uh, independent dealers across the country, uh, which can be found at husqvarna.com and then the dealer locator, which actually you can find um, any location in the United States. 
Great. Um, some folks are asking about any maintenance. Yeah, I know we're used to electric tools and equipment having way less maintenance, but besides recharging a battery, um, what maintenance uh, tips can you guys give? Um, well, Jason, let, let me let me say it from AGS's perspective, independent, uh, what we have found over the past 10 years. Um, for mowers, blade maintenance, keep the blade sharp, clean the deck. It's pretty straightforward, but it doesn't occur a lot. Um, so when we do our training, we really impart uh, to them, hey, you, you do have to keep up on this uh, to be successful. Also, a compressor with a reducer on it. Um, they should be daily uh, uh, with compressed air, uh, cleaning the battery caverns and then uh, the batteries themselves that make the connection with the tool. Uh, definitely that in and of itself in, in, in our experience has given these tools uh, longevity. And um, also just be a little bit more mindful not to bang them around. Now, the tools are abuse tolerant, but you know they are uh, electronics. And if you can prevent uh, some of these uh, uh, unnecessary traumas to the tools and the way you handle them, you're gonna uh, you know, extend the life of those tools. So that's kind of a, a preventative measure. There have been some questions about recycling batteries and Dan, you, you touched on it a little bit in your uh, conversation, but I'd open this up to any of the three of you who might have, uh, I don't know whether Ego and, and Husqvarna are working on that side of things, but you know, I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's a common question with, with battery technology, like what about the batteries at the end of life? Uh, so I saw both actually, I saw one about recycling their existing gas card equipment. Um, that I would recommend potentially even bring it to your local dealer. They might want to use it um, refurbished and made, made for parts reasons, et cetera. But for batteries, I would look at, um, you can find just Googling in your area, sometimes call to recycle uh, and places like that. But we don't have any per se official partnerships in the recycling space just yet. Yeah, with, with Ego, we don't either real partnerships. I know a lot of the box store brands have a recycle program of any type of battery, not just an Ego or a Husqvarna or any other brand, right? It's all types of different batteries. Uh, we reference a lot of RecycleNow.com to a lot of customers uh, with that, but most of the independent dealers have some type of resource just from dealing with batteries that are on their gas power products, right? That, that they have over the past, they have some resources as well. So that we, we refer to our retail side of the business. This came up in the chat a lot, and maybe you guys could just comment quickly is, you know, uh, where can people find landscape companies that, that prioritize electric and, and use electric? if they're in their city. I'm sorry, Joe, what was the question? So people are looking to have, you know, a landscape company that uses electric power equipment. Where can they go to find, find these companies in their cities? Um, well, they, they can go to our website. Uh, we have a program where we, we do service pro certification and then we vet them though. Uh, and then they, they get a, a, a listing on our site and then um, on top of that, you can go to some of the um, uh, nonprofits that exist out there like Quiet Clean PDX, uh, Quiet Communities, they have some listings and uh, also just, just a Google search. Uh, but, but we know there's roughly 250 that exist uh, that are on our radar uh, nationwide. So definitely there's, there's a need to expand that. But, but just uh, go on a search on Google. You can go to our sites and some of the others that I listed. I'll put the um, uh, Quiet Clean PDX has a good directory for the Portland metropolitan area. I'll put that in the chat. Um, but it's going to be a, it's going to be location, local locality by locality that would have a directory like that. Perfect. Great. I think we're coming up on time. So I really want to thank uh, Jack, Jason, and Dan. Uh, for such a fantastic webinar. Uh, I think we've learned a ton. We will send the recording out tomorrow uh, along with the slideshows. Um, so please um, let us know if you have any comments or questions that we weren't able to get to and we'll, we'll field them to our presenters. Um, anything else to, to add to that, Brian, before we sign off? No, I'm uh, really 
glad, thankful to have all you guys here. And um, all, I hope this was inspiring to our audience to take some steps in their own backyard to help clean up our yard care one more step, uh, move towards what I think you can see is clearly the future, which is these battery powered tools. And I, I can say from what I've seen from Ego and, and Who's Barna that, you know, they're not just dabbling in this area. They're really committing um, resources to R&D. I think hopefully you saw that today because I think they both feel, I'm speaking for them, that, that this is the future. I've heard it. They've said it themselves, so it's easy for me to parrot that. But um, I think you can all help to accelerate us towards that clean future by taking the steps in your own backyard. So thanks very much and good luck all of you with your electrification pro projects. And thank you again to our panelists and everyone who showed up today. And uh, we'll talk to you next time. All right. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.